So let's just kick off the day by seeing if anybody has any questions you would like me to go over from the practice problems. Go ahead, Liam. 16? Certainly. Uh, this is a... I, w I would say the reason why it's challenging is there's multiple reasons. One is there's a lot of moving parts to this problem, mathematically speaking, and you haven't seen one like this yet. Um, we are going to make what's called a Norman window here, and a Norman, a Norman window has a shape of a rectangle capped with a semicircle. And I say a rectangle capped with a semicircle even though this line here that is the border between the rectangle and the semicircle, that line there is not part of the window frame. Okay? It's a single piece of glass with a single frame going all the way around. Uh, the perimeter of the window is 8 meters. So when you look at this question, well, I'm going to keep going. The perimeter of the window is 8 meters, and you want to maximize the area. It doesn't say you want to maximize the area, but you don't want a window. The purpose of having a window is to let light in, generally speaking. right? If you don't want a lot of light coming in, you can always draw the shades or the blinds, but if you do want a lot of light in, you want as much as possible. So we want to maximize the area. The fact that you're told the perimeter of the window is going to be 8 meters is, well, that's a little bit of a contrived statement. You could, if you had the money, make the perimeter whatever you want. But to turn this into an interesting math problem, we have that. And that is the constraint. That's the constraint in this question. Okay. And we can come up with an equation of constraint in a bit. But in the meantime, let's get back to the thing that wants to be maximized. You want to maximize the area. So the area is the area of a rectangle and one half of the area of a circle. That's what semicircle means. It means it's only half of it. So. This is a very unique problem, and we haven't encountered this situation before, where if you develop the equation for the thing you want to maximize, in this case, area, you actually have three variables. And what we're going to do here, Liam and everybody, is not get rid of two of the variables at the expense of the third. In other words, we're not going to try to change them all to R or all to L or all to W. We're going to change them to the suggestion in the textbook is X. And you'll notice in the diagram they've suggested that you call the base of this rectangle 2X. There's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that if you call the base 2X, then the radius... can be called x. It's a way of, of eliminating the need for a fraction. So right away, I can, and let's just refer to this as width, OK? And this dimension on the rectangle is length. So I have length, width, and radius in the diagram. Right away, I can rewrite this as length times 2x plus 1 half pi times x squared. So I can eliminate the w by putting 2x. I can eliminate the r by putting x. I still have to write the length in terms of x, though. So I, I'm not writing the length in terms of w. I'm not writing the length in terms of r. I'm writing the length in terms of x. And this is where the constraint is going to come in. The 8 meters, the 8 meters, everybody, is the perimeter. And if you look at the diagram, what is the perimeter of this? Well, it contains an L and an L. This forms part of the perimeter. This 
forms part of the perimeter. That's 2L. The bottom forms part of the perimeter, so that's 2X. And then the other part of the perimeter, I will highlight. The other part of the perimeter is that, that blue cap. But that's half of the circumference of a circle. So this is one half of the circumference of a circle. And the circumference of a circle, and you can look on your formula sheet, there's no need to memorize this, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So this is 1 half of 2 pi r. 1 half of 2 is 1. So that blue length, that blue arc, the semicircle, is pi r. But r is x. So this is another, this is what I mean by a lot of moving parts here. The radius is x. So now what I can do is rearrange that equation for L, substitute the result into my A equation, differentiate it, find the critical values, and I'm done. And I, I say that as if it's going to be easy, and it's not, because you can see when you rearrange that equation of constraint, it's not going to be a simple expression. It's not going to be like your, for example, your oil drum question where you rearrange for h and you get h equals the volume over pi r squared. This, when I rearrange that equation of, the const of constraint for L, my first step would be to take the 8 and subtract the 2x and subtract the pi x, and then I have to divide by 2. Now, let's just stop for a second and think, everybody, about what's going to happen to this expression for L. We're going to put it here. We're going to put it right here. And then, I hope it's obvious, you're going to want to multiply the stuff through so that you can differentiate it. For that reason, I don't think we should just write, Liam, 8 minus 2x minus pi x all over 2. I think we should take 8 over 2 and 2x over 2 and pi x over 2. I, I think this is the best way to look at half of that expression. So I just want to double check my work. Uh, the perimeter is 8. That's correct. It is L plus L plus the width, which is 2x, plus half of the circumference, which is pi x. Good. If I rearrange that, I get 2L equals 8 minus 2X minus pi X, which is fine. And I divide everything by 2. Are you, are you good to that point, Liam? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that result for L and put it right here. giving me A equals L, which is 4 minus X minus 1 half pi X times 2X plus 1 half pi X squared. Double check my work. I think that looks okay. I'm going to simplify this because differentiating a simplified function is, well, simpler. So I multiply that, just give me a second. <laughs> What's going on? What's happened here? Oh. I can edit that out. Okay, uh, I feel better now. Uh, so let's multiply that 2x through, and I'm going to have 2x times 4, which is 8x. I'm going to have 2x times negative x, which is negative 2x squared. I'm going to have 2x times 1 half, negative 1 half pi x, which is negative pi x squared. And then I have plus 1 half pi x squared. 8x 
minus 2x squared minus pi x squared plus 1 half pi x squared. You know, I want to bring these last two terms together. I, you don't have to. You certainly don't have to do that at this point in time. But I'm thinking if I have negative 1 pi x squared plus 1 half pi x squared, I can write a equals 8x minus 2x squared, no, minus 1 half pi x squared. This would be like having minus 1 r plus 1 half r, or whatever, you know, minus 1 half of a pizza plus 1 pizza, 1 half of a pizza, rather. I don't think I said that right. Minus 1 pizza and plus 1 half of a pizza. Now I can differentiate. So are you okay to that point, Liam? Okay, so now I differentiate. dA dx is equal to 8 minus 4x minus pi x. And the interesting thing here is as complicated as this setup and function looked and was, you end up with a linear equation. And the only thing is, this is a case, everybody, where I don't, I don't believe it's really easy to look at that and tell me the critical value of x. I think this is a case, and it's rare where I would recommend doing this, this is a case where you should actually write down that it's equal to 0 and solve that equation. So we move all of the terms that have x to one side. And I would probably move the x terms to the right side where they become positive. I can factor out an x and have 4 plus pi. So I'm getting for a critical value of x, 8 over 4 plus pi. Now, we want to be careful that we don't just say, well, that's the answer to the question. We have to look at what the question was actually asking, which I've long since forgotten. What is the width of the window? Okay. Well, the width of the window is 2x. We found x. So I need to multiply that. And, and just I'll just put the brakes on for a second. There's only one critical value, then that's the answer, or it leads to the answer to the question. We don't need to find a derivative chart or do anything like that. So if x is 8 over 4 plus pi, then the width of the window will be 2x which is 2 times 8 over 4 plus pi, which is 16 over 4 plus pi. And, you know, we can certainly calculate what that is. That's going to be a little bit over 2 meters. I, I, I don't know why I would remember this, but I seem to recall that they actually have 16 over 4 plus pi in the back of the book, I think, as an answer. It's about 2.25, 2.24 meters. Is, is that okay, Liam? You know, what I, what I would say to everybody is, and I've mentioned this quite a few times, there's kind of two alleys that we find ourselves in in this course. One is I'm teaching you stuff so that I can find out if you can do it on an exam. And the other alley is I'm teaching you stuff to help you out next year. And I would say this is in that category. Or at the most, this would be an assignment problem, but not an exam problem. It would be something you could work on on your own or with somebody else or ask for my help. Uh, other questions? Number four on 199. Okay, this is a very important question, and I'm glad you're asking about it, Demi, because this is an important question that will help you with assignment 4B, which is not due until next week. Um, and I want to be careful here not to 
you know, tip my hat too much about assignment 4B, but I'm going to be referring to it from time to time. So we want to build a box with a square base and an open top. We already know what that looks like. Uh, I'll just freehand it this time. So it looks something like that. That's a square base open top box. And let's let's skip past here, Demi, all of the details about the cost per square meter of the side and the cost per square meter of the top or the base and cut to the chase. We want to maximize the volume. This is the, this is kind of a starting point for us because if you want to be maximizing the volume then you need to have a formula for volume. And we know that volume of a rectangular solid, it's called a rectangular prism, but I just like saying the volume of a box is length times width times height. Well, I would always recommend that if you have a square base, call both dimensions for the base S. Or you could call them both X, it doesn't matter. I'm just using S, and that means that the other dimension would be the height. So, well, let's just write S squared H. And Demi, are you okay with me saying the volume is S squared H? Okay, and just in a moment of clarity there, I realize this is not quite like the barrel problem because those costs per square meter here are not going to be built into the formula that we're using to maximize something. They're going to be built into the formula that's the constraint formula. Now, if you were to talk about the total cost here, the total cost is $1,200. And that's fixed, so this is our constraint. By the way, I'm just going to stop here, Demi and everybody, and highlight for you, I'm sure that you know this, but in case you don't, because there's a lot going on, this needs to go. We don't want S and H, we want only S. So we can then find DVDS and answer the question. And we're going to get rid of it by using that $1,200 as a constraint. So what does that mean? Now we have to look at the cost per square meter. If I were to look at the area of the base of this, the, I know I wrote C, but that S squared, Demi and everybody, is simply the area of the bottom in square meters. If I take S times S, I get so many square meters. But the bottom costs $4 per square meter. So if I wanted to find the cost to construct the bottom, I would take whatever S squared is and I'd multiply by 4. The sides, so let's follow this very carefully. This side has an area of SH. And this side has an area of SH and this side has an area of SH, and this side has an area of SH. So all of the sides have a total area of 4SH. Whatever S times H is, that's the area of one of the sides, and there's four of them. But that's only the area. We need to multiply that by 2. So just to explain this in a little more depth, and you don't need to write this down unless you want to. This is dollars per square meter, and this is square meters. This is dollars per square meter, and this is square meters. So we're taking area times cost per unit area to get cost. Is that okay, Demi, so far? Okay. So uh, I'm going to clean this up now. We can write cost equals 8s squared plus 8sh. 
And I might as well put in the $1,200 because that's the fixed cost. So there's my equation of constraint. The H has to go, so we're going to rearrange this equation for H. I can write 1,200 minus 8S squared equals 8SH. So now I can divide everything by 8S. Oh, it's a 4. Thank you, Farn. That's a 4. A 4S squared. Is that what you guys were going to tell me as well, Zevi? Okay. So it's, you're right, 4S squared. Thank you. So I end up with 8SH is equal to 1,200 minus 4S. So now I have to divide everything by 8S to get H by itself so I can eliminate the H. So I'll have 1,200 over 8S minus 4S squared. <laughs> There's a squared there. 4S squared over 8S. Make sure I got all my errors fixed. I think we're good. This is equal to H. So H is equal to uh, 1,200 over 8 is 150. Ben says yes, 850. I might as well write 850 S to the negative 1. 150? Did I say 150 originally? Okay. My brain is, now I'm going to write 850 again. I don't know what's going on with me today. 150. Uh, and then minus 4s squared over 8s is minus 1 half s. You guys better be eagle-eyed on my work here today. Is that correct? Okay. And this is equal to h. So where we were going with this before I started stumbling around was we had volume equals s squared h, and the h needed to go. So now we have to put this expression here in for H and get volume equals S squared times 150 S to the negative 1 minus 1 half S, I'll put to the 1, although it's not really necessary. Uh, don't forget here, Demi, we always want to simplify before we differentiate. Uh, I mean, within limits. If you had a binomial raised to the 10 and you wanted to differentiate it, you don't want to multiply that out 10 times. So now I'm going to have volume equals 150 S. I'm adding the two exponents, the exponent of negative 2, or sorry, positive 2 and negative 1 to get an exponent of 1. And then I'm going to have minus 1 half s cubed. Again, I'm adding the two exponents. In this case, it's the exponent of 2 and the exponent of 1 to get s cubed. You okay with that step, Demi? Okay, now we're ready to differentiate. And you can see since it's a cubic polynomial, when you differentiate this, you're going to get a quadratic dv ds will be equal to 150 minus 3 halves s squared. Look, sometimes... You don't have to play by the rules that I say we should be playing by. You don't have to express this as a simplified fraction. Because it's quadratic and there's no linear term, it's possible to just take this, set it equal to 0, and rearrange for s. If your derivative is so simple that doing that is quicker than 
multiplying the top and the bottom by 2 to get rid of the fractions, then just do that. So now what I can do is I can solve that equation to find my critical values of s. I'm going to add 3 halves s squared to both sides. I can multiply both sides by 2 now to get rid of the half. So 2 times 150 is 300 equals 3s squared. I can divide both sides by 3, as is the case with a lot of the author's questions in this textbook. He's put a lot of thought into getting nice numbers for answer answers. Not all the time. Absolutely. That's the other option is instead of the question is could I factor out the three halves out of the derivative? That's another option as opposed to multiplying the top and the bottom by two. Factor out the three halves. And I hope you see that you're going to get 100 minus s squared. Yeah. So by the way, when you take the square root of this, you're going to get s equals plus or minus 10, the square root of 100. So we have, Demi, two critical values of s. We have positive 10 and negative 10. s is a dimension, a real-world dimension or length, so s cannot be negative, which means the critical value of s is 10. So, we're, you know, mathematically, if you were doing a, a problem, say, next year or on a written response this year, this is what you would do. You would do that, and you would write out a reason why you're excluding it. But ultimately, then, s is 10. So we go way back to the beginning. What were we asked? What are the dimensions? OK, well, it's 10 meters. It's a big box. By 10 meters, by the height. And we have to go to our equation of constraint to find the height. So we can put 150 over the s, which is 10, minus 1 half times s, which is 10, equals the h. I'm getting 20? No. Yeah. No. 10. I'm getting 10. Don't, don't draw unreasonable conclusions here. that, oh, the maximum volume is going to occur when it's a cube that's 10 by 10 by 10. Because I'll tell you right now, and I think this will be obvious if you give it a little bit of thought. If I change this $2 per square meter to $3 per square meter, that's going to upset the apple cart. It's going to change everything, right? So just be very, very careful about that. Anyway, Demi, are you okay with that explanation? Perfect, thank you. Other questions? I thought I saw somebody's hand up in here. Farhan? Question 7 on page 196. This one? So we've got an apartment complex that has 120 apartment units. And if this person, this is a very old textbook, obviously. If this person charges $400 a month for rent, no problem renting them all. But what they've discovered, they've done a market survey, so they've hired a company who has economists and mathematicians, and they've done surveys. The survey says that, on average, if you increase the rent by $10 a month on all of the units, you'll only be able to rent 119. What this is saying is, when you increase it by $10 per unit, I don't know what I'm drawing here. This is a renter. You lose one renter. Right. That's kind of a pictorial of what's going on. So what should this person rent in order to maximize the revenue? Well, the revenue is going to be the number of units multiplied by the number, I shouldn't say number, multiplied by 
the dollars per unit in the video. So since the number of dollars per unit is 400 plus 10x, because x is the number of $10 bumps, this would be what you could differentiate. If you, I don't, I don't know. I guess there's nothing wrong with differentiating it before you multiply it out. So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Uh, does that look okay? I think that, that's fine. I hope, you know, and I say this all the time because I've never been perfect and I don't plan on living my life perfect. I hope you learn from my mistakes, right? And one of the important things to note here is I knew something was wrong and I was going to get a negative critical value for X, which is possible. It just means that she needs to reduce the rent. But then I saw I was going to get a negative critical value of, this is not right, but I was going to get a negative critical value, it would have been negative 140. And, and if that's how many $10 bumps, that means she's going to take $400 and reduce it by 140 times 10. She's going to be giving them money to live there. Go ahead. And that's true, too. Uh, and, and there's a, another problem. It might be in this section. It might be in a different section where that comes into play. If Farhan, and we're getting a little off track here in terms of the masses, but in terms of your question and comment, if X was negative, which sometimes it's possible for it to be, then that would mean that when you put that negative value of x into 120 minus x, you're going to be renting more than 120 units, and you can't do that. So uh, let's finish this off. Uh, dr dx, there we go, uh, negative 400 minus 10x plus 120 minus, no, plus 1,200 minus 10x, 400 minus 10x, that's negative, negative, plus 1,200 minus 10x. So what we end up with here is 800 minus 20x. Well, that's interesting. If I factor a 20 out of that, I'm left with 40 minus x. So the critical value of x is 40. I say that's interesting because she's going to have to double the rent. Because if the critical value of x is 40, then the cost per unit will be 400 plus 10 times 40, which will be 800. The number of units that she will rent is only 80. 120 minus the 40. Okay. And you know what? This, this one is not really that bad. Um, it's just that I haven't worked an example like this into our practice problems. One of the things you need to know, and this is from Math 30-1, and this is even known to those who are in 30-1 right now. x squared plus y squared equals r squared is the formula for the equation of a circle as long as the circle is centered at the origin. So let's imagine that this is a circle centered at the origin. That means that this circle has a function, not a function, I guess a relation, of x squared plus y squared equals 4, because it's equal to r squared. Now, what that means, and this is sometimes lost on us after we get into rules of algebra, you kind of forget about what a graph really is. What that means is that every single point on here will make that equation true. So if we knew the coordinates of this point and we took the x-coordinate 
and squared it, and we took the y coordinate and squared it, we would get 4. So that's going to be our equation of constraint. And the reason why it's an equation of constraint is we want to maximize the area of the rectangle. And the dimensions of the rectangle are defined by this point. To avoid negatives here, I'm simply going to say that if I maximize the area of this thing, which is only half of the area of the rectangle, I'm going to be maximizing the area of the rectangle. If, if half of it is as big as possible, the whole thing will be as big as possible. And then what I can do is say that this is x and this is y. So I've got a very tidy formula here for the area. The area of that pink, well, I want to say square. It's going to be a square. It's going to turn out to be a square, but it's a rectangle, equals x, y. So how do I get rid of, say, y? I use the equation of constraint. I think you know where to go, but I'm going to finish this one because it's a little bit interesting. When you rearrange for y, you end up with y squared equals 4 minus x squared. So that means that y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. OK. So area equals xy, x times y, y is 4 minus x squared to the half. So this is where you might start to get a little jittery. Because you go, OK, well, I'm going to have to differentiate that and find a critical value of x. But we've differentiated these before. It's just that it's not polynomial. It's not rational. It's radical. Uh, I'm going to use the product rule. So I'm sorry, Arden, are you OK to there? OK. I'm going to use the product rule to find the derivative here. dA dx is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second and again we kind of I think most of you are getting to the stage where you get on autopilot am I right here that you just kind of just run through the motion so make sure that you are very careful about differentiating that now what do we do with this um, I was gonna say we have to get rid of that half but we don't we, we hit a little bit of a jackpot here because those two twos cancel. So fractions are no longer a worry. Now we need to factor. So what are we going to factor? Each of those two terms, I'll underline them, each of these two terms contains 4 minus x squared raised to an exponent. We're going to take out 4 minus x squared raised to the lowest exponent. Arden, can you tell me what we're going to have left out of the first term? I hope you don't just mean this. Good. I, I knew you knew, but I just wanted to make sure. Raised to an exponent of 1, which we don't even really need to write. And then here we're going to have minus x squared. Our derivative then, dA dx, is going to be 4 minus 2x squared over 4 minus 1x squared to the half. I guess we can take out a 2. Are you okay with that? Okay. So looking at the denominator of my derivative, my critical values of x that make the derivative not defined are 2 and negative 2. My critical values 
that make the derivative equal to zero are the values that make the top of the derivative equal to zero, which are root two and negative root two, because x two minus x squared equals zero would mean x squared equals two when you take the square root. Uh, negative numbers are out because in the context of the question, my rectangle is in quadrant one. That's the best way to think of it. Maybe it's better to just say it's, it's a shape. The length can be positive only. Does anybody know why two is out? Right. The length of the bottom of that pink square or rectangle, it's going to be a square again. The length on the bottom is 2 here, which would mean the only way to bring this point down here would be to have a rectangle that is 2 wide and 0 thick. In other words, if you put 2 into your formula for area, if you put 2 in here, you're going to get 0. That leaves root 2 as x, and if root 2 is x, then y is 4 minus root 2 squared, square root, it's going to be root 2 as well. So that's why I said it's going to be, that quadrant will be a square. So the dimensions of the rectangle, what were we asked? The largest area, well, root 2 times root 2 is 2, root 2 times root 2 is 2, the area of the largest rectangle is 4. Yep, far end. So that question, can you just break that up just for the sake of time here? Just explain the two for the hypotenuse and two for the other two for the division. Are, are you saying, can we just find the area of this, maximize that? Sure. It would be 1 half xy. There's that constant thing. If you have that constant of a half, but it's still xy, it's not going to affect the critical values of x. So yes, it will work. It's just that then when you, you'll still get a critical value of x of root 2. y will still be root 2. But when you find the area, you'll have to multiply that triangular area by 4. And you'll still get 4. Any other questions? Sure. <laughs> That'll probably take us to the end. So here's finally one where we're going to have to do a first derivative chart or, or do some real Sherlock Holmes mathematical sleuthing here to find out which is a max and which is a min. So we have a piece of wire that's 40 centimeters long, and we're going to cut it into two pieces. One is going to be bent into the shape of a square. So I'm just going to say that this will be the piece of the wire we bend into the shape of a square. And one is going to be bent into the shape of a circle, so I'm going to say that this is a circle. And keep in mind, this total length is going to be equal to 40. And really, That's the constraint, isn't it? I, I mean, I guess you could not use all of the wire, but common sense says if you want to maximize the area, you would want to use all of the wire. A and you are using it, because it says you cut it into two pieces. It doesn't say you snip off part and throw it away. So what do we want to maximize? We want to maximize the area. So A equals, well, S squared plus 4 s squared plus pi r squared. The, f the area of a square can be calculated by taking the length of the side and squaring it. The area of a circle can be found by using pi r squared. Now, what this distance is from here to here 
is 4s. Because I have to bend that so that it has four equal sides. So I have to bend it in half and bend each of these in half and then form 90 degree angles to complete the square. So I didn't do a fantastic job of drawing this. Let me see if I can fix That's not bad. So this is S, this is S, this is S, this is S. This distance is 2 pi r because it's the circumference of the circle, right? And that means that our equation of constraint here, Arden, is this. Now, we have to get rid of in our area function either s or r. And I don't think it really matters which one we get rid of. Because let me just rewrite my equation of constraint. It's 20 equals 2s plus pi r. I've divided everything by 2 to make my journey a little more comfortable. So from a standpoint of which is easier to rearrange for, s or r, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. We're going to have fractions no matter what we do. And from a standpoint of substituting in to our area function what we get for s or what we get for r, it doesn't matter because one has r squared and one has s squared. So I'm mentally, I am deciding to rearrange for s. There is a reason why. If I rearrange this for s, I'm not going to have pi in the denominator. That's it's not a big deal if I did, but I don't want pi in the denominator. And if I rearrange for s, when I substitute s in, I'm just going to square it. I'm not going to have to worry about multiplying by pi. So let's see. 20 minus pi r is 2s which means s is 10 minus 1 half r. I, I divide everything by 2. I divide 20 by 2 to get 10. I divide 5. I'm missing my pi. I divide pi r by 2 and get minus 1 half pi r. We good there? OK. So this is a slow journey. I don't think this is something you want to be impulsive in, completing your work. We're going to take this thing and load it in here. So we get area equals 10 minus 1 half pi r quantity squared plus pi r squared. And now we, we have some decisions to make. Do you want to differentiate it now, or do you want to multiply it out? My immediate thought here, everybody, is that this, I'll highlight it so that everybody can see exactly what I'm talking about here, is that this is maybe something where I would differentiate first. The reason why, and you don't have to, you could FOIL that binomial squared out, but the reason why I would differentiate it first is it's quadratic in R, so the derivative will be linear. Simplifying a linear after the differentiation is easier than FOILing out before, I, I think. So I'm going to go ahead and differentiate this. And I don't, I've done this same question every year, for 30-some years, and I always am a little nervous about the outcome here. Because it just it doesn't look like it's going to come together. I swing the 2 around the 10 minus 1 half pi r. 
I drop one from the exponent and I multiply by the derivative of what's inside. Don't forget I'm differentiating with respect to r. So the derivative will be negative one-half pi, the coefficient of that r inside. And then plus the derivative of pi r squared is 2 pi r. Are you okay with that? Okay. This is in the exact same boat as the Norman window question. I think we should set this equal to zero and solve it as an equation because it's linear. So I'm going to have zero equals, and I might as well just start expanding this, right? Well, no, I'm, I'm going to do this in steps. So the first thing I did here, everybody, is I multiplied this 2 and this negative 1 half pi together to get rid of the 2 and the half. That's why I just have the 10 minus 1 half pi r times negative pi. Now what I'm going to do is expand that out. So I have negative pi times 10. I have negative pi times negative 1 half pi r which is positive one-half pi squared r plus two pi r. I don't like fractions, and because I've given us permission to write equal zero, I've given us permission to multiply both sides of this equation by two to get rid of the fraction, which you couldn't do if we still had dy dx there. So I get 0 equals negative 20 pi plus pi squared r plus 4 pi r. Now I'm going to start rearranging for r by moving the 20 pi to the other side. Keep going to you, Arden, to double check my work. I think it's OK. I factor out the r to be left with pi squared plus 4 pi. You know what I just realized right now is I could have divided everything by pi a little bit earlier. I don't know at what stage I could have done that, but I could have divided everything by pi. But that's OK. Now I can divide both sides by that pi squared minus 4 pi to get 20 pi over pi squared minus, sorry, plus 4 pi. I can factor a pi out of the denominator, which allows me to cancel the pi's, which I could have done up top. I could have just divided both sides of the equation by pi. So I get for r 20 over pi plus 4. And I will never forget the first time I did this question. And I thought, I, I was working on it with a class, a very young teacher, taught the course, I think it was the first time. And I thought, I think we got this. And I went to the back, and it wasn't even close to the right answer. Because that's not what they're asking for. They're saying, how should we cut it? Right? So r is 20 over pi plus 4, we have to take 2 times pi times 20 over pi plus 4 to find out the length that we cut for the circle, and the rest will be for the square. So do you have the answers handy? Can somebody, can we find them? And I will do my calculations. 20 divided by 4 plus pi is this, now that's just r, so pi times r times 2 is the circumference, 17.6. The other length for the square would be 22.4.
correct? Yeah. You'll have to speak up, please. I didn't square R? Oh, because the 2 pi, yeah, the 2 pi R is the circumference. So 17.6 and 22.4? Okay, good. But see, if I didn't, now comes the tricky part, and I got about seven minutes to do this in. If I just said, what is the maximum, you would say to yourself, well, I got one critical value, right? I got a critical value. So it has to be the one that corresponds to the max. But I'm trying to think, just give me a second to think of the best way to explain this to you. If we go with this as being, I guess I'm going to use x. If we say x is the length of wire that's used for the square, the domain for x is this. Because there's nothing, there's nothing that says it can't all be a square, technically. I mean, I maybe disagree with this a bit because it says it's cut into two pieces. But let's imagine it's possible, and that's the only way we're going to get a minimum. If I say to you that, oh, no, no, I want this to be x, well, then the domain is still that thing. Okay? So what does that mean? We were working in terms of r. If 2 pi r if 2 pi r could be as small as 0 or it could be as big as 40, then r has a domain of that. I've divided that original domain by 2 pi to get r. So r can be any number, any number between 0 and whatever 40 over 2 pi is. Oh, by the way, is the answer to A that it's all a circle? Yeah. So we need to consider the fact that we got a critical number of, help me out here, 20 over 4 plus pi. Okay. But we also have a critical number of zero. So the best way for me to explain this to you is to say we're going to have to do a first derivative chart that goes from zero to this critical number of 20. Uh, and by the way, maybe we should calculate 40 over 2 pi. It would be about 6 point something. about 6.4. This critical number, and we are so far beyond high school calculus right now, okay? You never have to do this here. But this critical number is in the domain, okay? So it's a critical number for sure. So we have to go from 0 to 20 over 4 plus pi. We're going to go from 20 over 4 plus pi to 40 over 2 pi. We have to investigate the behavior of the total area in all of these intervals. Okay. It's a closed interval. Yep. Okay, we'll take a look at yours in a bit, or tomorrow. But. So what is our derivative? Man, this gets really ugly because look at our derivative. Look at this thing. 
you have to put in a number between 0 and, what did we say this was, 2.8. 2 1 is in there. And I know I'm going to run out of time here. But if you put 1 in here, let's see what we get. And Liam, my response to your question might have to wait until tomorrow. I'm putting 1 in for R. I get a negative. for the derivative. I believe we're going to get a positive here. I'm going to go on faith that we will. Which means y, which is really area, is decreasing then increasing. So just a second here. If it's decreasing then increasing, this will be a minimum area that number we found corresponds to cutting those and creating a minimum area. What will the maximum be? Now it gets even more complicated. Because at the beginning, the function is falling. So there's a maximum at the beginning, because it's falling. At the end of the function, it's rising. So there's a maximum here you need to now calculate what the maximum area would be if you had nothing for r, which means it's all a square, and if you had nothing, if you had 40 or 40 over 2 pi for r. Anyway, we'll see you guys tomorrow. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too worried about this. Now, Demi, I'm going to answer your question now. We'll see you guys.